Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to today's Presentism in Teaching History webinar. Um, before we go any further, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone uh, that this webinar uh, is being recorded um, and that the resulting recording will be posted online and circulated by email after the event. Uh, my name is Rodri Mogford and I'm the senior publisher for the Bloomsbury Academic History List uh, and the in-house editor for the Bloomsbury History Theory and Method Digital Resource. Uh, the resource was named one of the best databases of 2022 by Library Journal, and you can see some quotes from their review on the slide uh, that you can see on your screens now. Uh, Bloomsbury History Theory and Method is an educational resource dedicated to historiography and the examination of historical theory and methods using a global approach. Uh, with an ever-growing content base, currently includes 167 exclusive articles by authors based in 29 different countries, a four volume major reference work on the global history of historiography and 71 ebooks focused on topics related to the subject. So I'm delighted to be able to introduce Tyson Retz, uh, who will be chairing the discussion today. Uh, Tyson is an associate professor at the University of Stavanger in Norway uh, and a vital member of the academic editor team who works so impressively on the Bloomsbury History Theory and Method Digital Resource. Uh, you can also see some of the names of the other members of the editor team on this slide, uh, including our editor in chief, uh, Stefan Berger. Uh, I'm pleased to say that Tyson is joined by five of the contributors to the resource, all experts in their field, uh, so that they can helpfully share their thoughts on presentism with us, both in the context of their own resource articles and on a wider level. Uh, Tyson will kindly introduce them individually very shortly. Uh, but for now, I'd just like to say a very warm welcome to Tyson and the panel. Um, thank you all in advance for what I'm sure will prove a lively and fascinating hour of discussion and insight. Thank you, Roger, for the introduction. Uh, welcome everybody who's attending uh, this webinar today, and especially uh, welcome to the five panelists. I'm really excited um, about uh, hearing uh, what you have to say about uh, presentism today. I'll introduce uh, all five uh, panelists uh, uh, together, uh, and then we will uh, proceed uh, to interview each panelist. Um, Roger has already said something about them. Uh, Terrell Carver uh, is a professor of political theory at the University of Bristol in the United Kingdom. Uh, he's with us today because he's written uh, for the Bloomsbury Resource, a, cl a classic text in context, and that is, of course, Marx's Capital. Um, which is exclusive uh, to the resource. Uh, professor Antoinette Burton uh, is a professor of history at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the United States, of course. Uh, she's with us today because she's written uh, an article, a key thinker article on Catherine Hall, uh, which I'm really excited to hear about. Uh, Dr. Devon Vatia uh, is assistant professor of history at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. Uh, he's, with us, he's with us today because he's written um, one of our historiography essays um, on the historiography of race uh, in Enlightenment thought. Really excited to, for, for Devon to be with us today. Uh, Dr. Nadine Russell is Senior Lecturer in History at the University of Essex in the United Kingdom. Uh, she's the author of the article Using Primary Sources, Police Records. Um, really excited to hear about this. Uh, for my own purposes, uh, supervising a student who, who, who's interested in this right now. That'll be fantastic. And lastly, Professor Hank de Smala, who is Professor of History at the University, University of Antwerp in Belgium. Uh, Hank is with us today because he's written a key concept article on masculinity. That's our five panelists, and I'll interview each panelist for roughly six minutes. Um, Let's begin uh, with uh, you, Professor Terrell Carver. Uh, you've written uh, a text in context uh, article us on Marx's capital. Um, and I'm interested in hearing from you uh, about the historical context in which, in which Marx wrote this famous book. Um, if you could tell us something about that, and if you could also tell us something about what you think students might miss uh, were they to neglect uh, the historical context in which that book was written. Okay, thank you very much. And I'd uh, like to say I was uh, really thrilled with this commission because over the years, Marx hasn't been very popular. 
uh, with many historians because he wasn't a historian. Uh, he didn't write so uh, historiographically in the genre. Uh, he wasn't a professional of anything. He was a political activist um, and uh, journalist uh, and pamphleteer. And so uh, he tried very hard to be a rabble rouser, but uh, he was more successful with the pen uh, than on the platform. So, uh, of course, there are the Marxist historians who are uh, around in the 20th century, and they've already made up their minds. And of course, that set up a um, struggle uh, in academia and elsewhere that's uh, as much political as it was intellectual. Um, so it's really interesting that um, he was uh, chosen to be here. Um, and rather than go deeply into the context of uh, the German state, stateless principalities, the Austrian Empire, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in the 1830s and 1840s, I would uh, uh, focus on the context that students bring to the reading of a book like Capital, whatever kind of class um, they're in. Um, and I've considered uh, what they think they know uh, and to give them an opportunity to find out more uh, and to uh, follow the text uh, in a sense wherever they like. But uh, as they do that, they'll encounter the intellectual historians and the contextual historians who will fill them in uh, on some of the political background that really makes uh, the book go and made Marx go. Mm. You've anticipated my second question there, uh, Professor Carver. I'm interested in, uh, in your own teaching. Um, have you uh, observed uh, presentist um, understandings creep into uh, the study of, of this book? Um, in answering that, you might want to tell us how you define presentism yourself. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to be on the uh, radical left field here again, uh, as indeed Marx uh, was with uh, what he wrote. Um, and my view about this is that uh, the present is only the past as far as it has got. And therefore, when we talk about the present, we're only referencing our own interpretations indeed of ourselves and of what we think we know uh, insofar as uh, we're doing that at the moment. So that's, that's my view of uh, the teaching that uh, goes on. But then I have to say, uh, possibly in deference to my colleagues here, that uh, I'm in political theory, political philosophy, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not um, teaching a history class in a history department or even um, saying that I'm a professional historian, although I'm a historian of political thought. So the, um, the students and um, the reading and discussions are all going to be very much uh, in the present. Um, for what the students are concerned with and what they can find in the book that helps them to think about uh, the politics of the present. So I'm resisting the idea that this is anything as crude as drawing lessons from the past or Marx or Plato or whoever uh, is going to tell us exactly what to do. And in fact, Marx resisted that himself. He's actually quite unpopular with many political people because he said he didn't want to write uh, recipes for the uh, Michelin starred restaurants of the future. I'm uh, paraphrasing. Uh, mm. what he actually said. So uh, in my teaching, uh, capital is uh, very much a way of stimulating students to get to grips with what they're concerned with or to find out from uh, myself, other students and reading, reading is more about uh, what they ought to be concerned with in terms of politics, political ideas and concepts. Thank you. Um... You note in your article that Marx has sometimes been charged with Eurocentrism and racism. Uh, to what extent, if at all, do you think that this is a presentist accusation? Well, I think one uh, needs to uh, consider where this kind of uh, allegation comes from and why and how it's built up over the years. So I would date this to the, the 1970s and Said's so Orientalism um, rather than Eurocentrism. I actually really love the book, 
Uh, but he's very hard on Marxists. He's very hard on anybody writing from an Anglophone, Euro, sort of, uh, you know, American uh, perspective uh, on the subject of um, knowledge appropriation and indeed of uh, imperialism and uh, subjugation and othering of people uh, with other backgrounds and other concerns. Uh, and indeed pushing them into the past and so I'm saying that uh, they're only going to get to uh, the modern present uh, with a lot of help or alternatively that they need to be pushed out of the way. So that's the kind of place that this is this is um, coming from. I think some, what Saeed says about Marx uh, is really based on Marxists and Marxism. He wasn't a Marx scholar and he didn't particularly want to do that job. Uh, my pitch for reading Capital, um, as you'll find it in the History and Theory um, collection, is that um, read the book backwards, because part eight, the final chapters, which have been neglected uh, for many years as not very important and not germane to the argument, are a fantastic um, uh, manifesto for post-coloniality and decolonization. It's actually all there. It's a, a story about uh, capitalism as global dispossession by violence, imperialism, slavery is all there. He was well on to it in the 1840s. And um, many of these uh, allegations arise from people who haven't really looked um, at uh, what was going on even as early as the 1840s, which is two decades before capital, mm, um, mm. and the kind of uh, politics that Marx was trying to do. He was basically standing on the Rhine looking east, um, where these places weren't even countries, uh, so they didn't have empires. Uh, they benefited from slavery because everybody did. Uh, outside, or rather in the uh, certain parts of the world, others disbenefited uh, from it. Mm. But um, his, uh, his, his political project really was bringing constitutionalism um, mm. and uh, eventually socialism and economic reform to places that were medieval. Uh, mm. and uh, studying capitalism as a warning for what was going to happen to them, and also um, a forewarning of what was going to happen to the rest of the world. Mm. So famously, uh, the, there's a passage about battering down the Chinese walls, you know, to further the opium trade. So, I mean, he's very much on side. So I think a lot of these allegations are quite unfair. Thank you, Tara Carver. I'm going to move on now to our second panelist, Dr. Nadine Rossell, who has written uh, for us on uh, using primary uh, in our collection using primary sources, and she's concerned in that article with using uh, police records as primary sources. Could you tell us a little bit, Nadine, about the origins of modern policing as described in your article? Yes, uh, many thanks. I, I hope the sound is okay because just when we start, there's a massive thunderstorm going on here. So um, I hope uh, everyone can hear me okay. Um, I think it's hail or something. Anyway, um, the the origins of um, policing as we understand it nowadays are historically speaking actually fairly recent. Um, I should say I look particularly at continental Europe, so that first, that's where my examples are coming from. Uh, but here really enlightened sort of police reformers looked um, to Paris and to France in the 18th century and then about a century later to London and the setup of the Metropolitan Police there by Robert Peel in 1829. Um, and that's not to say that they weren't uh, that the issue that the task of policing and uh, didn't concern princes or rulers or kings and queens before, but what we consider as sort of modern police forces really relates to the 18th and 19th century. Um, police forces then had different tasks. Than, than today, uh, we, we tend to think about police forces particularly being occupied with um, combating crime. And obviously that, that, that is a key task of the police and also was in the 18th and 19th century. But 
at that time, a lot of duties the police had, we would now link to more local authorities or to municipal officers, because a lot of it was around checking permits, maybe for market traders, um, registering people, uh, dealing with that type of documentation and paperwork, um, dealing with issues related to, related to public health. So a, a lot of the tasks that um, people in those two centuries would link to the police, we wouldn't nowadays anymore. Mm, mm. And that's not a particularly new thing either. Police tasks change. If, if we think about that, you know, the 20th century, a massive task for the police is traffic policing, which is hardly an issue in the 19th century. And then if we move on further there, there are new fields, police forces always add to their portfolio. Um, but I think that's important to keep in mind that in the 19th and 20th century, it, policing was a much broader category than we now, when we now, than what we now define as policing. Mm. Yeah, could you talk more a little bit about that, um, what we consider to be policing and the broader uh, platform uh, uh, on which the concept might have been understood or at least practiced uh, earlier? What are some of the challenges of using uh, police records as historical sources? Um, in the article uh, for um, the collection, we look particularly at police records um, for students. You know, what, what would the how could students use police records um, for maybe their first research projects? And in that sense, police records are quite challenging, uh, despite obviously me thinking that they're fascinating. Um, because first of all, police records are difficult to access. Um, there, there are very few um, big online collections of police records. So really, you will ask students to go to archives. They are scattered across archives. You need to know quite a bit about how police forces are organized and to, which, mm. to whom they are accountable to be able to figure out which sort of archive is the right one to go to. Um, so for students, that, that's not the most appealing source that immediately draws you in. Um, and then of course, in terms when we actually look at police records, they are very often, we, we think policing, uh, well, I hope lots of people think policing is a very exciting field. But when we look at police records, they're, they're standardized routine administrative report writing, right? They, they are often, despite the very exciting topic, quite dull in the way they're written um, because they are done by people who are used to standardized report writing and very often are actually much more interested in the part of their work that is not about report writing. So, you know, in, in, in terms of, um, as I said, sort of appear to draw you in, that, that, is, uh, that is sometimes a, a, a tricky source. Mm. Um, and of course, police records, particularly like records, I think also from other state organizations, particularly those who have the monopoly of violence, um, very often conceal more than they reveal. And, and that's, you know, that's something to, um, to work around uh, as, as well. Mm. Thank you, Nadine. Uh, Henk de Smala. Um, you have uh, given us a fantastic uh, article in the key concept section on masculinity. And you note in that article that um, the concept of masculinity is rather, is rather recent, a uh, relatively new uh, concept. Could you tell us uh, something about the origins of the concept and how it's sort of gained traction uh, over the years? Okay, yes, uh, thank you. Um, Yes, um, of course, uh, speaking about presentism, you know, um, masculinity always um, is, is almost a presentist concept. It's something that originated, let's say, after the Second World War within feminist uh, circles, within uh, feminist studies uh, more broadly, um, in a tendency, of course, to denaturalize what it is to be a man or a woman, and of course, to kind of criticize or politicize or analyze the workings, for instance, of patriarchal societies and how uh, power uh, is organized in a gendered way. So it's it's uh, part and parcel, let's say, of the feminist understanding of, mm. of power and of how societies uh, are organized. Of course, for centuries, people talked about unmanly behavior or manly behavior or about manhood and, and things like that. But uh, usually, of course, in a kind of 
not criticizing or not questioning, let's say, the, the, the natural order uh, of society and, and the natural or the, the understanding that these are natural uh, concepts. So in that sense, it's only after the Second World War and increasingly so in, in historiography in the 1980s uh, and then in the 1990s that you see the rise of uh, books on um, masculinity and the history uh, of, of masculinity. Mm. Yeah, and you you do note uh, differences between Western, or at least you treat differences between uh, Western and non-Western uh, concepts of masculinity. Could you give us an idea of uh, of, of of some of those differences? Yeah, I'm I, I'm afraid I haven't done that enough in my uh, article, to be honest. Uh, of course, it's something very challenging if you're asked to write about a concept like masculinity in. A, for, for a collection like this one in, in very brief, let's say, kind of uh, article. Um, and so you start, of course, thinking immediately about uh, American and British uh, historians. So even as a Belgian scholar, you know, uh, you feel like you, um, in my position, I'm uh, in the periphery, let's say, of what is happening within the center of, of uh, history writing. And so you immediately think about, uh, authors like uh, Michael Kimmel and Stearns and whatever, you know, the, the, the big, you know, historiography written by Anglo-American uh, scholars. So, but of course, you realize that, um, you know, I haven't even written about French uh, scholars in my article, you know, as a Belgian, you know, uh, so it's, it's, you, you all, all, all almost immediately uh, feel like um, you, you, you need to write about these Anglo-American uh, scholars. That's the general history. And then all the all of, of the rest is, let's say, a kind of extra. Um, so, but anyway, so, uh, but of course you see that um, also in other historiographies, um, people writing on African history, Asian history, and so on. Of course, the, the, the concept of masculinity is also introduced. And so I referred to some of these um, uh, books, um, in which, of course, you see that people are very um, aware that introducing the concept of masculinity is not just, it's not just something general that you can then contextualize, but that it already brings certain assumptions um, with it um, on, on binary distinctions, on a kind of uh, modernization uh, uh, paradigms, uh, you know, uh, thinking about natural bi biological categories and then cultural ones, um, you know, gendered ones and so on. So you, you so I've, I've referred, let's say briefly also, of course, to this broad Problem, uh, you know, when you are uh, uh, adapting uh, um, these kind of um, concepts that sound very general to other uh, contexts. Mm, thank you. And among your among students and, and colleagues, do you see a, a president's trend here in in how a concept such as masculinity of recent coinage uh, is being uh, used historically? Is it adequately historicized? You might ask. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's a difficult one. So I'm I'm teaching a class on the history of gender and sexuality, and um, so increasingly, of course, you are confronted with the fact that uh, students kind of question uh, your position, um, and that they um, you know reflect on or are very interested as well. Of course, very curious to know uh, you know where you are somehow um, you know positioned um, whether you are. Um, what your sexual preference is even and so on so so it's 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 um and and, and people question easily uh, nowadays of, or, or seem to assume that uh, for instance uh, as a man uh, as cis uh, gender man um you know i am um able to historicize in certain ways or to 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 talk about certain histories and uh, it, it's apparently or they they suppose it's more difficult for me to understand for instance what it uh, would have been to be a woman in the 19th century and being mm. diagnosed with uh, hysteria, for instance. So it's, um, yeah, it, it's very, it, it, it's certainly teaching that the history of gender and sexuality is, um, you feel like uh, your your own positionality is, is increasingly also um, questioned or is, mm. uh, you know, that, that it's, and it wasn't that way, I think, like 10 or 20 years ago in, in, uh, in Belgian universities. But it, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, of course. It's it's something, you know, it's something new. It's something that you feel like you have to deal with more uh, than, than than in the past. And it makes you think as well about the top, topics you're teaching. Uh, I, I find it increasingly hard, let's say, to talk, for instance, about um, 
medical doctors diagnosing patients, just talking about, for instance, scientific discourse without also um, uh, having attention, let's say, to the patients, or um, so you because you feel like uh, you know students. Uh, want or are very are very interested, let's say, in also seeing um, the, the 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 resistance or, the, or or what it what it meant to be racialized or medicalized or so so it, yeah it, I, I think it has an impact on on the uh, the way I teach. Thank you, Professor Hank Desmala. Uh, Professor Antoinette Burton, um, you've written a key thinker article for us on Catherine Hall. Um, in which you write that she's a leading feminist historian of empire, race, gender, and the nation practicing in Britain today. Could you tell uh, our listeners who perhaps have not heard of Catherine Hall what they might learn from her work? Sure. <clears throat> sure. So Professor Hall has always been interested in helping us challenge history, the history of Britain as exclusively white, male, and middle class. And that, in fact, was uh, the topic uh, title of one of her edited collections back in the 90s. She's part of a post-war generation of scholars who began thinking through gender and class and then moved toward an insistence that race and empire have to figure in all of our histories of how Britain has become what it is. And over the course of her career, she's done this in a number of ways that, that readers or listeners can explore, first by researching the impact of imperial ways of thinking and knowing on the so-called island story of Britain, uh, second by focusing on the impact of singular figures, singular and impactful figures like the missionary William Nibb and the historian Thomas Babington Macaulay, mm -hmm. and last but not least, by leading the Legacies of British Slavery Project, which in addition to driving public conversations in Britain about the role of slavery in modern British history has created this amazing online database of British slave ownership, which contains information about every slave owner in the British Caribbean, Mauritius, or the Cape, and hundreds of Caribbean uh, names of slave owners, attorneys, mortgage, mortgagees, and legatees that had been identified for the estates between 1763 and 1833. So taken together, her work has really transformed uh, how we approach the history of Britain, empire and slavery, um, primarily by, I think, by showing its origins in the combination of material processes and the symbolic universe of racial capitalism. Hmm. Might I ask uh, how you yourself define uh, presentism? <clears throat> uh... I most often encounter presentism, presentism as an accusation, uh, linked to convictions that history is an objective science, that we can study it in isolation from the present, and indeed that we should rescue it from the biases and prejudices usually associated with liberalism and the left. So my own definition uh, of presentism is the embrace of the conviction that history writing is not an objective science. It's a practice that grows out of contemporary contexts, and that historians of all stripes are immersed in the historical present in the ways that shape the methods that we use, the objects of inquiry that we choose, the archives that we identify and have access to, and the interpretive frameworks that we work through. Um, so uh, I think we're all historical subjects. We're subject to the same contingency uh, as the historical subjects that we study. And to be honest, the brouhaha over the question of presentism ratifies the very definition of the term. That is, battles over how the past should be written tell us more about the politics of our present condition, I think, than anything else. Mm -hmm. I suppose that's anticipating uh, my third question. The concepts of gender, race, and empire are highly politicized, emotive political issues. Would you say this means Catherine Hall's work is uh, particularly relevant to a discussion of presentism? So yes, those concepts are certainly politicized, and they always have been ever since they've been mobilized, whether singly or together as frameworks for apprehending the past and, of course, the present. And many of you know in the U.S. we're in the middle of a critical race theory uh, crisis. <laughs> um, most often, scholars like Hall have used those categories intentionally to draw attention to how and why histories, like those of slavery of women or colonial subjects, are inherently acutely political. And I see political here simply as operating in a field of power. Um, but as Hall's work also suggests time and again, it's not just gender and race that are political. Subjects like religion, the market, war, violence, the media, the environment, there's no arena beyond politics or beyond the fields of power 
through which human societies are constituted and function. So Hall's body of work has definitely helped to advance these arguments in the British Empire context, and they are now the most common framework for history writing in the West and globally as well, which I think is one reason we see such a backlash against them. Mm. And how do you think Professor Hall herself would react or what would she make of uh, some of these present day debates? Well, it's very hard to speak for Catherine, so I will not, but I, mm. I do think she has always managed to combine a rigorous commitment to empiricism, that is to the materiality of evidentiary claims about any historical subject she takes up with a methodological approach that challenges any easy partition between the present and the past. The how did we get here question, which animates her work, has always been informed by the where do we see it from question. Questions that have animated her generation of historians and has profoundly shaped mine as well. Um, the debates on presentism, which as I also suggested, I think are often a trussed up version of a call for return to history as an objective science, represent the original forms of politicized history that long masqueraded as neutral and disinterested and excluded working class people, women, and colonial subjects for centuries. Hmm. So Catherine's work, oh, okay, want me to stop? Okay, fine. No, 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 absolutely, you may. Just one last um, hmm. sentence, Catherine's work, I think offers a variety of models for denaturalizing those claims. And as the essay in Key Thinker shows, her career long scholarship itself models how entangled the historian's life and work is with the very historical conditions from which it emerges and indeed, how could it be otherwise? Thank you so much, Professor Antoinette Burton. That was fascinating. Um, Dr. Devin Vatia, um, you have contributed one of our extended essays on the historiography of race in Enlightenment thought, um, in which you note that historiographers paid little attention to the concept of race and racism uh, until roughly the Second World War. Um, could you tell us how and why um, that changed? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I think the first uh, work to mention here would be Dialectic of Enlightenment by Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno. Uh, published in 1944 uh, by, of course, two uh, German Jewish Jewish intellectuals who fleed uh, Nazism uh, and uh, uh, settled in in the United States in Los Angeles. Uh, and although in that text they didn't discuss race uh, extensively, they did have one chapter on anti-Semitism, and they really laid what can be considered sort of the first charge from the left of the Enlightenment as not an emancipatory project, but rather perhaps a project that has led to increased social control and even oppression. Uh, but more importantly, in the post-war period, um, I think we should look to the context of the 1960s and 70s with uh, decolonization and nascent Holocaust studies to see when uh, uh, race and racism are really taken up uh, in the field of Enlightenment studies. So uh, concerning uh, uh, the history of anti-Semitism and Holocaust studies, um, uh, Leon Polyakov and George Moss's work is really important here. So looking at the long durée origins uh, of the Holocaust in which the Enlightenment is very central. So uh, uh, as a period in which uh, roughly speaking, we see uh, a switch from pre-modern anti-Judaism to sort of modern pseudo-scientific uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, and then in the context of, uh, of decolonization, um, uh, the work of a French scholar, uh, Michel Duché, I'd like to mention in 1971, it was published, uh, Anthropologie et Histoire au siècle des Lumières. And this is an untranslated classic, but really a, a wonderful work that looks at five Enlightenment philosophes and in which she places them in the context of what she calls a neo-colonial interpretation of the Enlightenment. Mm. Could you tell us something uh, more um, about the Enlightenment conception of race? Uh, how does it differ from uh, that which we might have uh, today? Yeah, of course. So I think there are two major differences that we should be aware of. And the first is the connection for 18th century Europeans of the race concept to nobility, which is quite lost uh, today. And the second one is its, um, uh, well, the lack of clarity of the concept in the 18th century. So to start with the first, so race entered European vernaculars in the 15th century and was first used to refer to the lineages of prized animals like birds of prey, and then quite quickly by uh, mm -hmm. uh, noble families who had uh, ancient uh, or, or, well, a deep uh, ancestry in the relatively deep past. Um, and so this in this concept, this, this 
linking of race to nobility and ancestry survives deep into the 18th century. Uh, so for example, the uh, dictionary of the Académie Française, the fourth edition in 1762, gives the example of, for a definition of races, he is from an old race, an illustrious race. So this is the first example that they give. And secondly, so the, the um, what's interesting is that 18th century dictionaries and, and encyclopedias don't actually register its modern uh, uh, pseudoscientific um, uh, usage. Uh, but of course, many thinkers uh, are using it uh, to refer to large groups of human beings that share uh, common ancestry and or physical features and the emphasis is placed variously. Uh, but what is striking is that thinkers important in this uh, second uh, strand, like uh, the French naturalist Buffon, uh, in mm -hmm. his classic work Histoire Naturelle, they use, they actually, he actually uses the concept interchangeably, or the term at least, the term interchangeably with uh, distinct uh, uh, concepts like species, nation, and people. So there's mm -hmm. quite a, a lack of, of uh, precision uh, here compared to what we see in 19th and early 20th century uh, scientific, uh, uh, yes, scientific racial classification, scientific racism. Mm, mm. Uh, switching over to our present day conception of race, um, to what extent do you think uh, historians might be guilty? I mean, guilty is a negatively loaded term. To what extent are they uh, projecting uh, the modern day conception of, of race onto the study of the past? Is that a good or bad thing? Yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, I, I completely uh, second Antoinette's uh, uh, concern that this is, of course, an accusation that that we should be very careful uh, to throw to throw around. So I definitely wouldn't uh, accuse um, uh, any fellow scholars very quickly of doing this. Um, I mean, I think that um, um, as an intellectual historian, what I'm interested in is, is the work that the concept of race did in 18th century thought. And so I'm always, uh, when I teach um, uh, my students, I'm always uh, um, very careful to, to remind them that it's it meant something different uh, in the 18th century. And we have to be very careful to study these things contextually. So for example, my students are often surprised to learn that uh, uh, justifications of empire in the pre-modern period, in the early modern period, were generally not uh, racial uh, uh, in nature. Uh, so so th this is something they always find uh, or often find quite uh, quite surprising. Um, that said, um, uh, I think that the, th there, was a, there was a recent article published by uh, the historian Venita Seth in uh, the journal History and Theory called The Origin, Origins of Racism, a Critique of the History of Ideas, in which she shows that some of the scholars in especially the debates on the ancient or medieval origins of race and racism um, are actually sometimes uh, fit into uh, Quentin Skinner's ca category of the mythology of prolepsis. Mm -hmm. So looking at past figures, so looking at the significance of an event, uh, uh, projecting its later significance onto uh, historical actors that they would not have recognized at all. And I think that this is uh, quite a powerful critique of some of the scholarship on in this debate on when and where race and racism started, that we really have to be careful about doing this contextually. Uh, that said, of course, I completely uh, uh, latch on to what everyone says that, that we cannot escape our present moment. And so it's completely justified to be interested in racial relations and racism in the past. Uh, and that's a, a very valid question to, to investigate, of course, historically. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll come back to it in the round table. That concludes uh, the interviews with the five panelists. I thank uh, each of them. Um, I'm now gonna hand back to Christina. Thank you, Tyson. Um, I'm just going to do a quick demo of the Bloomsbury History Theory and Method platform, which published all the articles you are hearing about today. And just a reminder before I begin that you can submit questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, we'll get to those questions after my demo. So here's the homepage of the resource, and you can see that the articles uh, discussed today are collected behind this top panel. And if you scroll down, um, you can enter the content by type and you have the five different series of exclusively commissioned articles for the resource. Um, one article from each of these sections was discussed today. We also have historiography critical readings, which is a full volume reference work examining the nature and significance of history writing from ancient worlds to the present day. And as well, in, as well as exploring content uh, by type, uh, you can explore by people, 
by types of history and by topic. And this makes it useful for students looking for content to fit their particular um, course format. And down at the bottom, you can see our research and learning tools section. Um, and uh, this contains our lesson plans and bibliographic guides uh, for teachers looking for resources. We also have 71 ebooks published by Bloomsbury. Um, and there's a couple more ways that you can access all of the content on the site uh, via a world map uh, and a timeline. And this means that uh, you can search for content geographically as well as by historical period. And I'll just click through to the world map to show you how that works. So here's a map of the world uh, with the darker areas indicating regions for which we have more content. Um, and let's just click on Europe and say you want to look specifically at Germany. Uh, clicking on that leads to a uh, search of all the content we have across the site from Germany. And you can see there are 105 results across 11 pages. And down the left hand side, you can see the taxonomy and you can narrow your search results by content type, including ebooks and article section, by people, by period, by types of history, by topic and by place. So let's say we want to look at our key thinker articles from Germany. Um, you can see all the kind of key thinkers that are covered here, uh, Hegel, Arendt, Nietzsche and more. And just going back to the top, uh, you can get back to the homepage by clicking the logo. And if we do that, we can have a look at the topic and focus, which is a collection of content curated from around the resource and offered up for free every few months. And currently we have our topic and focus presentism in teaching history. And all the articles are collected here that are discussed today. Um, and you can see them in their sections as well. And clicking on a section header allows you to see all the articles published under that section. So in essays on theory, method, and historiography, these are the extended essays. You can see we have 63 different articles. And uh, just going back to the homepage, I'll show you that um, you can also browse content through the top um, as well as by the homepage. And you can explore more on our about page too. And you'll all have a chance to explore the resource for yourselves as we'll be circulating free login details um, uh, after the event. So look out for that email later this week. And now I'm gonna hand back to Rodri. Thanks very much, Christina. Um, so yeah, I just want to um, open up the uh, Q&A round table at this, uh, at this point. Um, coming back to uh, the definition of presentism. Uh, we've got our various definitions back up on the screen there for people to digest and, and, and mull over. Um, our first question then is simply, how should we define presentism? Uh, some of you obviously define presentism as the notion that studying the past has no value if you can't draw conclusions from the present. Uh, and others defined it as projecting modern day values onto the past. Um, Terrell Carver's definition suggests that there's no present at all. Um, you know, th then we have the idea that presentism is simply reading the past through the lens of the present, um, and the stronger version of that claim, uh, namely that we can't escape who we are in the present as we try to understand the past. Uh, so which definition is right? <laughs> Tyson, I wonder if you can uh, lead us off maybe with uh, with some thoughts on that. Yeah, when when I uh, hear the word presentism, I, I think of um, Benedetto Croce, the early 20th century uh, Italian uh, philosopher, philosopher of history, who said that all history is is contemporary history, uh, by which he meant not that um, all historians write about the recent past, um, but that there is simply no other way of writing history uh, than through uh, the lens of the present. Um, that opens up all sorts of problems and, and discussions, but, but, but for me, uh, I like to, to think of presentism uh, in that respect as something um, unavoidable and, and something that enables um, new historical insight uh, rather than being something that necessarily needs to be overcome. Of course, um, that doesn't mean that we write the past um, as we like to think about it 
in the present. There's obviously some discipline involved here in, uh, in, in treating the past um, as something separate from the present as well. Uh, but I think Croce's uh, uh, phrase uh, helps us uh, uh, conceptualize uh, that in the first place. And I suppose, I mean, if I were to pass on the baton now, uh, uh, Dr. Vati, I was, I was interested in what you said uh, towards the end there uh, with regard to Quentin Skinner and contextualism. There seems to me there to be, in, in especially in intellectual history and the history of ideas, there's a real tension between uh, contextualists who try to treat ideas in context and those of a more conceptual history, Kozalekian bent, who kind of see concepts as accruing new meanings over time. So that distinction between past and present might not be as, 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 as distinct. Um, just. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think there, uh, you're right to point to some disagreements, I think, among intellectual historians. I mean, I, I, I quoted Skinner uh, because I, uh, for my book, I uh, drew from his methodology uh, especially like, so the, the collection of his essays, visions of politics. Uh, so, um, and, um, uh, but of course the, the, you know, he, him and, and, and fellow Cambridge school practitioners have been accused of antiquarianism, uh, if, which, which I think is, 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 uh, is a is a false accusation in the, because what they're interested in is of course uh, what you know what Skinner says so so concisely is is seeing seeing things their way so the, the way the, the historical actors way so it's a it's a constant conversation I think between present and past and and the power of that uh, of that approach I think is to uh, you know to to open up new possibilities to see that uh, you know our uh, uh, what things that we take for granted are not necessary. We're not, you know, always taken for granted. And to uh, so, so this is one of the most powerful things I think of of uh, uh, of, of a truly contextualist his history of ideas. Um, uh, but other kinds of history, of course, do this as well. I mean, it's not uh, limited to to intellectual history to to open up this way, this this kind of alienation from the present. Uh, uh, yeah, that's that's what's key. I think is that it's not just a just justificatory practice for how we see things. Rodri, um, shall we move on to the next question? There are some fantastic yes. questions up here. Um, yeah, I'm. Would you like me to go? We've got a pre-submitted question from a professor emeritus, John Olson at Queen's University, who um, sort of pre pre um, pre booked this question. So I, I wonder if we can ask that one first, and then maybe move on to to the questions that have popped up. So um, the question that John's provided here is: Is the trope presentism a good way of headlining a number of issues related to the role of the present in history that are ongoing in historiography, or is it a slogan arising from larger metaphysical debates therein? As John says, my question would be to the contributors, um, uh, what do they make of the way the supposed problem is formulated? Is there not a need for some philosophical analysis of this trope? Uh, and where does the craze for big history fit into this story? I, I don't mind saying something about a uh, big history here. So, so um, uh, I'm, I, unfortunately, I, I can't remember the name of the author of an article that I recently read. I've, I've, I taught a course on big history uh, for the first time this academic year uh, with uh, a geologist, uh, two historians, other historians, and a social geographer. And it was a great learning experience. And one of the, the way that we started off the course was to actually begin by critiquing big history uh, because it's so, um, it, it, it risks um, taking out human agency from history because human beings are just sort of at the mercy of larger forces. Uh, uh, and so this is this is just something that that popped up. I, I don't. I think I may have missed the core of this of the question. Sorry for that. But this is something that that, that I that popped up to my head of just the uh, the. It was very helpful to uh, remind my students of the risks of doing history in this way. There are of course benefits, but there are also big risks. And and this requires of course very careful philosophical reflection of like, yeah, uh, the, these issues of human agency. Yeah. 
I thought I heard in the question a reference to epistemology, and I guess at this juncture in the conversation, I might just ask people to recall the way that the modern discipline of Western history is related to the modern practices of empire, <laughs> uh, colonial knowledge extraction and production, the notion of objectivity, of who counts as a historian and who counts as a historical subject. So all of those questions, I think, are part of our inheritance here. And there's some questions in the chat, uh, which I or the Q&A, which I think may touch on these, but I just wanted to resurface that the historicity of the discipline and its relationship to imperialism as a way of knowing and, and thinking and being, I think is really important here. Can I add to the um, agency issue that was raised before? I think um, I think it's very important, particularly when we think about teaching um, history uh, to students, that we think about the different levels of agency of you know, of the um, people we, we talk about, because I think sometimes there's the, um, perhaps the suggestion that, um, it, it, you know, if we provide the historical context of a particular worldview or of a particular, you know, society, that the assumption might be that that's the only way how people could have acted, uh, because, you know, I, I work in Germany, uh, because, um, anti-Semitism was uh, 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 the view of, of uh, quite a lot of people at a particular point in time doesn't mean that we we are suggesting that there aren't any opposing views or that you couldn't have disagreed with that type of view. So I think um, the, the, the idea of what level of agency we allocate to um, the people we talk about um, is is quite important and it also doesn't mean that there is lack of responsibility in one way or another uh, and I think that that's important to keep in mind. I, th I think that raises lots of uh, interesting issues uh, about who uh, is allowed to be an agent um, to write what becomes known as history and so uh, it's good to reflect on all the histories that don't get written or uh, are only recently rediscovered or redefined as history. So uh, feminists, uh, uh, historians, and uh, uh, historians from uh, of all different kinds from all, all over the world uh, have um, been, you know, admitted to the circles of Anglophone knowledge production. Um, and students often find this very exciting. I'm external examiner somewhere. And um, I mean, by far the best uh, essay uh, that I read uh, out of a selection was on the Haitian Revolution, which um, has certainly been written about before. So some historians knew about it, but there is a literature actually coming out of Haiti from uh, people who are native there about that. And so um, this can be picked up by students. So there's an awful lot wrapped up in this um, um, concept of agency and also the concept of um, the genre of history or historiography. And, what counts and who polices that, uh, not least uh, research councils. So uh, I, th I think this uh, uh, resource that Bloomsbury has, uh, has done um, is you know, a gateway out of some of that, uh, at least I hope it is, certainly because it's global. Thanks, Professor Carver. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that we've, we've got some really good, uh, but really big questions coming through on the on the chat here. I think, you know, sort of six or seven or eight now it is in total. Um, and we're running a bit short on time. Um, Tyson, I don't know if you've had the chance to have a quick look through that list. I mean, you might be better placed than I to maybe sort of yeah. pick one that you'd like to kind of dive into now. And mm -hmm. who knows, perhaps maybe afterwards we could, um, you know, sort of maybe get some uh, correspondence on email as well, if anyone wants to kind of uh, offer some thoughts offline uh, to, the, to the, the, the people that have uh, been kind enough to submit some questions that we might not get time for today, unfortunately. Mm. I think we could say a little bit more uh, about um, 
um, and I think Hank Tasmala might be uh, good here, um, to say a little bit more about concepts to which um, the historical subjects uh, did not have access. Um, so uh, it's a good example for, for masculinity, if it is a, a concept that's only really uh, gained purchase recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. And it's it's actually also a hard uh, question. And it's, uh, you know, as a historian of, of masculinity, of course, um, what you usually do is you um, look, let's say, at texts or, um, um, you know, read your sources looking for um, faces of people uh, kind of um, suggesting at a certain moment in time what masculinity consists of. And uh, quite often it's in um, by, by, by seeing how uh, certain people are called unmanly or how people are criticized or, um, or for instance, of course, in, in, in a colonial context, how um, uh, subaltern people are, um, um, you know, um, uh, supposedly effeminate or uh, lack um, masculinity, and so so from that, from, from these uh, traces or from these sources, you kind of construct what masculinity as an ideology or as a system consisted of in 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 that period. But of course, you're doing that as a historian. You're kind of making a construction, or you, you're making a construction visible that, in a way, was hegemonic or supposedly hegemonic, and therefore um, remained let's say invisible or not what uh, was not um you know analyzed uh, in those terms was not seen in in those terms at, at the moment well of course it it's still um the, the same goes of course with um also sexual categories um is there um of course it's a long debate on on whether there's a history of uh, homosexuality before um you know the, the invention of the term homosexuality in the in the 1860s and and so on and so forth um, so that's uh, it, it, but it remains um, a, a a very hard, let's say, to see how uh, subjects in the past um, whether they had any notion, let's say, of or whether they thought of themselves uh, in 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 those gendered uh, ways, or whether they uh, also indeed had a kind of assumption or a kind of understanding of uh, the notion uh, of masculinity, uh, for instance. So it's a it, it, it's, I think, one of the, um, talking about presentism, it is, um, you know, that's what we always do, I think, as, as historians, kind of um, starting from um, thinking um, or analyzing today what we think is important and what creates hierarchies, for instance, and power relationships, and then see how that worked in a different context and in a different time. Um, where these concepts did not as such uh, exist and um, seeing how maybe that world functioned differently and so how we cannot assume that we immediately understand uh, these uh, worlds and that we are, as the word has been used as well, are alienated a bit from it. That's giving also hope, of course, because then we can start seeing how things you know, can be different or were different, and and um, and so on, and and so so yeah, it's it's um, of course I you know I'm a bit circling around the question, but I think it's it's something that is um, a, a fixed component of of what mm. history writing is all about, actually. Um, mm. Thank you, uh, Professor Burton. I'm interested uh, in your response to to this question. We've had something um, about the potential dangers of of presentism, and if we grant uh, too positive uh, a role to presentism uh, do we risk um, do we risk losing something of the wonder of entering into an alien past of of, uh, of, of, of learning something new from the past independent of our own uh, frames of uh, frames of reference in, in the present thanks I just think there's so much debate about any of the given topics or methodologies around questions of race and gender and sexuality, that it's not really a danger of blocking plural, let's say, visions out. But I also think the incredibly roiling debate about this does obscure the question of what is the proportional role of presentism mm -hmm. <laughs> in the shaping of narratives about the past. It has a role. Is it the dominant role? Is it the only role? What are the other factors? So I think the debate itself, which is highly politicized, um, and I think if we think about 
someone in the chat said it's fairly commonsensical. It's what you find in the undergraduate classroom. We're all immersed in the present. How can we escape it? But the truth is that the, the discipline of history in the West was built on the conviction that not everyone should have access. I think um, Tyson, you may have uh, referenced this or someone did. Um, it was constructed out of, in a kind of gatekeeping way as, a, as an objective science designed to shape, you know, who counted. Certainly, Terrell, you said this too, who counted as a historical subject. So I think that, um, you know, keeping in mind the power relations in these questions, as well as the proportional role of presentism in any of our methodological approaches is really important. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a few more questions. Uh, we've had some fantastic responses that I think um, touch on a number of different elements of, of the various questions there. Uh, do we have time for one more? Shall we conclude things there? Yeah, I think we I think we've reached time, and I think uh, we'll we'll bring uh, things to a close. Um, thank you, everyone, for for being here today. Um, it was fascinating to hear from all five participants. Their articles um, are available. Uh, Roger, you might want to say something more about that um, in terms of the articles that are available. Um, Yes, thanks, Tyson. Yes, so um, as Tyson mentions, you know, all of the articles um, are currently available on the resource. Um, it's been a fascinating discussion. I just want to thank uh, Tyson and all of the panelists for all of their, um, you know, really intriguing contributions. It, it really, you know, sort of a lot of food for thought, I think, over the course of the entire hour. And it's clear that you've, you know, have engaged uh, everyone that's that's um, taken the time to kindly join us today for the webinar, given the number of questions we've had. And, um, uh, you know, it's obviously, um, you know, as I say, served up a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of things for, for people to consider. Um, yeah, as Christina mentioned earlier, there's going to be free login access that is going to be, uh, made available to everybody who's uh, signed up for the webinar today so you know people can take a much deeper dive of the resource and, and get a feel for for what, what it's all about and just exactly how much content that we've got there that's um, you know sort of all, all joined up and connected that you can you can click from one article to another for and um, yeah I, I just want to thank everyone and um, to say um, goodbye from from everyone here at Bloomsbury and um, have a good rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.